Picture this. The United Kingdom is replacing a capability that quite literally lets you see a modern air war unfold in real time. And yet the first British E-7 Wedgetail, the aircraft that's supposed to become the RAF's new airborne early warning and control backbone, spent 2025 taking off just four times. Not four sorties a week, not four a month, four flights in an entire year. And according to the information disclosed via official channels, it never once switched on its radar. So what's going on here? Is this a routine case of cautious flight test pacing or a red flag that Britain's next generation eyes in the sky program is sliding into the same procurement swamp that has trapped so many Western defense projects? Let's start with why the E-7 matters. An AEW and C aircraft is not a nice to have. It's the difference between reacting to threats and shaping the battle space before the first missile ever leaves a rail. It ties fighters, ships, ground-based air defenses, and command centers into a single picture. It manages the airspace, identifies targets, deconflicts friendly traffic, and crucially, reduces the fog of war that modern electronic warfare is designed to create. If you're a country trying to deter a peer threat, an AEW and C platform is one of the highest leverage assets you can field. And that's exactly why the details here feel so uncomfortable. Seven flights total since the first flight in September 2024, and a year where the aircraft reportedly never radiated with its radar, suggest that this isn't simply we're taking our time. It points to a program in which the most sensitive, most complex part of the system, the mission system and radar integration, is either not ready, not cleared, or not allowed to be exercised in the way you would expect at this stage. Now, to be fair, not turning on the radar can mean more than one thing. In flight testing, there are phases where you're proving basic airworthiness, handling qualities, reliability of engines, power systems, environmental control, and a long checklist of safety items. You can fly plenty without ever emitting. But here's the catch. This aircraft's purpose is the radar and the mission system. If you're not validating those early, you're compressing risk into the later phases where delays become harder to recover and more expensive to fix. So the real question becomes, is the program pacing deliberately conservative, or is it stuck behind a bottleneck? The reporting points to several plausible bottlenecks, and none of them are exotic. Shortages of materials, components, and skilled personnel have been hammering aerospace globally. That's not a talking point. It's a structural reality after years of supply chain shocks and a workforce that takes a long time to train. When you're building and certifying a complex aircraft, you can't substitute your way out of missing avionics modules or specialized labor. If one critical line item slips, the whole schedule can turn into a game of cascading dependencies. But supply chain friction alone doesn't fully explain the political and procedural side of this. The UK is receiving its first example of this type under a national acquisition and acceptance framework, and Boeing has to pass a British process that is often more demanding than outsiders assume. That includes documentation, airworthiness evidence and safety cases tailored to RAF operations. And the moment you add an advanced radar and mission suite, you're not just certifying an aircraft, you're certifying an aircraft as an operational node in a national and allied command and control network. That's cybersecurity, information assurance, emissions control, interoperability, and rules about what data can be collected, stored, and transmitted. It's not just does it fly, it's does it fly safely, securely, and predictably in a coalition environment? Then there's Boeing's own reputational gravity well. After the 737 MAX crisis and other high-profile quality control controversies, any government buyer is incentivized to be seen as cautious, and any military customer, especially one with a bruising recent history of procurement embarrassment, will overcorrect toward rigorous verification. Britain does not want another situation where a program enters service with fundamental issues that were known but tolerated during testing. The Ajax armored vehicle scandal is a perfect cautionary tale. If you accept too early, you don't just inherit a platform, you inherit a political liability that can dominate headlines and budgets for years. From that perspective, an RAF and MOD culture that says we will test and retest is rational. So if caution is rational, why does this still feel like a problem? Because capability gaps don't care about rational procurement governance. The RAF retired its E3D Sentry fleet and the Wedgetail is meant to replace that strategic airborne command and control function. Every month the Wedgetail is not operational is a month where the UK either leans more heavily on allies, relies on other sensors that cannot replicate the same coverage, or accepts a reduced ability to independently manage complex air operations. In peacetime, that's an inconvenience. In a crisis, it can shape the options leaders have on day one. And here's where the fleet size decision becomes unavoidable. Britain reduced its planned order from five aircraft to three. On paper, that saves money. In practice, three is a brutally small number for a high-demand, 
high-maintenance aircraft that needs training pipelines, spares, upgrades, and periodic deep maintenance. Even with a perfectly healthy program, three aircraft struggle to generate continuous availability. One aircraft is in maintenance, another is in training or upgrade, and suddenly your fleet becomes a single operational jet or none at all if something unexpected happens. So when you read about a slow flight test cadence, it's not just a scheduled detail, it's a warning sign amplified by the thinness of the planned force structure. Now add another layer. What exactly does not turning on the radar imply about the maturity of the mission system? The E-7's radar is not a bolt-on gadget. It's integrated into power, cooling, and data processing architectures. It feeds a battle management suite that must fuse tracks, filter false returns, resist jamming, and produce a picture that operators can trust. If you're behind on software integration and modern military aircraft are in many ways flying software ecosystems, then you can find yourself with an airframe that's ready while the brain is not. And software delays are uniquely stubborn because almost done can still be months away, especially when certification, security accreditation, and operational test requirements enter the picture. The reporting also hints at an official silence. No public comment, no clear timeline disclosures, citing commercial confidentiality and operational sensitivity. That's understandable. Nobody wants to hand adversaries a neat chart of capability readiness. But silence has a cost. It invites speculation and it erodes confidence among observers who remember how often sensitive becomes a euphemism for we're not on schedule and we don't want to say it out loud. So what's the most likely reality? Not a single dramatic failure, but a convergence of mundane constraints, supply chain limits, skilled labor shortages, an acceptance process that is deliberately strict, and a program environment where Boeing is under intensified scrutiny. The expectation mentioned, additional test flights and acceptance into service during 2026, suggests the program still aims to land within the original broad window, but the tempo matters. If the aircraft is flying only a handful of times per year, you're not building momentum, you're fighting inertia. Flight testing is not just about data collection, it's about learning cycles, fixing issues, retesting, and steadily expanding the envelope. Slow cadence means slow learning, and slow learning tends to become slow delivery. And that brings us to the uncomfortable strategic question. In an era where air and missile threats evolve fast, can Western procurement systems afford slow and careful when slow itself becomes a vulnerability? What happens when your adversary iterates faster than your acceptance paperwork moves? What happens when the political decision to buy fewer aircraft collides with the operational reality that readiness requires depth and redundancy? The wedge tail may still enter RAF service in 2026. It may still become a highly capable node in Britain's air power architecture. But this episode is a reminder that modern defense capability is not just about selecting the right platform. It's about sustaining industrial capacity, maintaining engineering talent, managing software complexity, and resisting the temptation to underbuy critical enablers. Because the harsh truth is this, the battlefield does not grade you on procurement intent. It grades you on what's mission ready today what can fly tomorrow, and what can keep working when the environment turns hostile. And right now, Britain's next eyes in the sky are still spending more time on the ground than in the air, while the clock keeps moving.